Good evening. I am Father John Christian Young, a priest of the Diocese of Butuan. And tonight I will be offering my reflections on the topic, Missionary Discipleship in the Local Church. My context is I have been president of Father Saturnino Urius University for the past 19 years. And so my reflections are necessarily informed by this experience of working in higher education. Of course, I have been reflecting and been involved in many initiatives of our own diocese. And I'm aware of uh, other initiatives in other dioceses in the Philippines. This National Congress and Symposium is, I understand, part of the celebration of the 500 years of the arrival of Christianity to Philippine shores. And this celebration is itself situated within the 500 years of the first circumnavigation of the globe by Ferdinand Magellan. When the Spaniards reached our shores in the Philippines, there was an existing and vibrant pre-colonial civilization. In our own city of Butuan, several artifacts were found which showed the great and advanced level of technology in terms of for example, gold smithing. It also showed the presence or the existence of trade, not only within the, what is now the Philippine Islands, but with places as far as China and India. So Christianity came to the Philippines. The first mass was uh, celebrated. Uh, the location of which uh, is a bit controversial uh, as Butuan has a claim also uh, counter to the, to the established claim of uh, Limasawa as the site of the first mass. But really in the greater context, in terms of the mission, it doesn't matter. What is important <laughs> is that Christianity reached the Philippines. We also have the first baptisms in Cebu. We know that, that King Humabon and his wife, Queen Juana, were baptized and also with a number of their followers. And so from the first contact with Christianity in the Philippines, the faith grew. The Philippines today has a population of 109 million. Some estimates say that we're actually around 112 million, 81% of which are Catholic. That makes us the third largest Catholic nation in the world behind Brazil and Mexico. The Philippine Church today is divided into 86 ecclesiastical jurisdictions, 16 of which are archdioceses, there are 58 dioceses, seven apostolic vicariates, four prelatures, and one military ordinariate. So we can say that the arrival of Christianity 500 years ago has borne much fruit. We can say that uh, the Philippine culture today is infused with the traditions and Christian culture. However, we keep in mind that there are ethnic groups that are not Christian. There are ethnic groups that are Muslim and there are uh, indigenous peoples that still practice their own religion. As we celebrate the coming of Christianity, and it's bearing much fruit 
in the islands of the Philippines. We also call to mind that there was an event after the, the first mass and the baptisms, the first baptisms, there was an event that gives us pause and makes us reflect. And this is the massacre of the Spanish by the newly baptized Christian king Humabon and his people. Uh, this incident happened after the victory of Lapu-Lapu in Mactan. And when the surviving Spaniards went back to Cebu, the massacre happened. This was brought about by the plotting of King Humabon and Magellan's slave Enrique. Now, according to Pigafetta, Humabon and Enrique arranged a plot and the slave Enrique returned to the ship where he showed that he was more cunning than before. So, out of this plot, uh, many of the, the survivors of the Battle of Mactan were massacred. And among those who were killed was the priest who baptized King Humabon, his queen, and his people, uh, Father Valderrama. So this makes us reflect you know, as we celebrate the coming of Christianity, as we celebrate it, the bearing fruit of the first missions in our islands, uh, we also reflect, just as we reflect on the significance of this uh, massacre. Uh, what, what does this mean? What does this tell us about, about our own journey? Out of the many reflections we may have, Perhaps this points to the reality that our own journey of relationship, uh, both as individuals and as a people, can perhaps be described by, by a journey that is marred by brokenness and unfaithfulness uh, in our own lives and in our journey as a people. Uh, we have often been unfaithful to our commitment to follow our Lord Jesus. Uh, we have often failed to respond fully and even sometimes responded in a way uh, that is contrary to, to the values of the gospel. But even as we remember our brokenness, we keep in mind that despite our brokenness and unfaithfulness, God remains faithful to us. Uh, and it is as broken and unfaithful people that God sends us. No, he did not send uh, perfect people. He sent people who are themselves in need of redemption and healing. Uh, we have in this slide uh, some texts that emphasize mission, no? both from scriptures and the documents of the church. We call to mind that as Jesus ascended to heaven in Matthew 28, he tells his disciples no? to go and make disciples of all na nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, thus, we know that the church, by its very nature, as Adjentas 2 tells us, is missionary. So we, who are called by God, by Jesus, to be His disciples, are at the same time and at once called to mission. All of us who are called to be His disciples are sent. And this is perhaps why our Holy Father Pope uh, Francis uh, emphasizes the term missionary disciples to, to show that each disciple is sent. 
each disciple has a part to play in the greater mission of the church. Pope Francis tells us that our status as missionaries is not a consequence of ordination but of baptism, that all of us are called to be missionary disciples, to be sent by Jesus and to speak on His behalf, not on our own. So all of us, the baptized, not just the priests, not just the religious missionaries, are called to mission. And this is something that has been emphasized and re-emphasized, but still, somehow, uh, very often, there is that split between being a disciple and being a missionary. What we are being reminded of is that mission and discipleship come together. Mission cannot be separated from discipleship. We just call to my that uh, this is not something, this is something that's familiar to all of us. We call to mind that uh, there are aspects to mission and evangelization. No? There's presence and witness, commitment to social development and human liberation, interreligious dialogue, intercultural dialogue, proclamation and catechesis, the liturgical life, prayer, and contemplation. No? Uh, and that uh, in the context of mission, there is what we call the new evangelization. And this has three principal settings, the ordinary pastoral ministry, uh, a second is that area of the baptized whose lives do not reflect the demands of baptism, meaning uh, the evangelization of those who are baptized but, but uh, do not always live their faith or practice their faith. And lastly, there is the evangelization that is direct directed to preaching the gospel to those who do not follow Jesus or to those who do not know Him or reject Him. So, the new evangelization. Uh, this is also something that is familiar to us as there are many talks and uh, congresses, in fact, that are dedicated to this. Okay. So, in this slide, we have the quote uh, uh, from, uh, again, Pope Francis in an interview with the, mag the magazine America uh, in 2013. And in that, the Pope says, I see clearly that the thing that the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness and proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds. And you have to start from the ground up. This quote is familiar to many of us. And I suspect that it is also the favorite quote of many of us. But if we, if we think about it, the Pope talks about the need to be near, to be proximate the need to start from the ground up. And perhaps this is the locus and context of our missionary discipleship. And this is really found within the local church. No? It is the local church where that is most near to the people, no? in a sense. No? Uh, uh, people experience the church locally because it is the parish, it is the basic ecclesial communities that is most proximate to the people because it is the church, you know, that face of the church where uh, they are part of, the people are part of. So what is the context of today of our field of mission, so to say? There are many you know, uh, in the Philippine context. Uh, we are dealing with, with the consequences of 
the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the numbers today are down, but uh, we know that, uh, that uh, the virus is still there and we don't know uh, what will happen next. No? Uh, Hong Kong, for example, and China and Korea are experiencing surges in their COVID numbers. So we're dealing with the pandemic. Uh, it is affecting the economy. It is affecting education. It is affecting our, our, the way of life as we know it. Uh, today, we are also dealing with issues of uh, climate change and biodiversity collapse. Uh, in fact, a climate emergency has been declared. And uh, 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 this is something that, that we need to really deal with. No? Uh, the scientists tell us that if we don't act soon, uh, we don't act to mitigate the effects of global warming, uh, we will have problems. No? It, it will be reversible, irreversible by the year uh, 2050, according to some estimates. No? Uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, corruption and exploitation. Uh, these are issues that are known to us, and these are issues that affect uh, many people. Uh, we also know that uh, pov poverty is prevalent in our country. Uh, in my own region of Karaga, uh, we are the second poorest region in the Philippines. No? And uh, we know no, it is, it is, uh, there's no debate about the fact that many of our people, uh, in fact the majority, are poor. Okay. We're also... We have been dealing with issues of violence, no? both as crimes, and uh, uh, we're also dealing with uh, extrajudicial killings. No? Um, so this is the sweet situation before us, and you can add more. No? The, the local context, uh, uh, in the local context, uh, we face uh, many, many situations, which in which. Uh, we need to act as missionary disciples. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we just came from a, a lockdown, no? a hard lockdown, and this has changed the, the shape and way of how we do things. Um, we keep in mind that many of our young people have not had significant human contact beyond their families. No, they only see their classmates in virtually, no, in virtual classes. No, for some, for others, uh, none at all. No, it's just their families. So this affects how how people think, how people act. This affects uh, our mental state. No, and those of us who are in parishes or are in contact with with uh, with the people know that. Uh, this lockdown has somehow affected many, no, uh, mentally and emotionally. Okay. So this is the context of of uh, our field of mission. We also keep in mind that uh, uh, technology has brought out sharp contrasts between generations, no. And let go through the details of this slide, but just to point out that. Uh, from the baby boomers and Gen X, uh, there are now the millennials, and there's now Generation uh, Z. You know? uh, each generation having different characteristics, so to say, you know? different cultures. You know? Aside from this general uh, cultural differences, there is also the, 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 the cultural differences that, 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 that are based based on ethnicity. In the Philippines alone, we have uh, many uh, uh, ethnic groups, no? ethnic cultures. And so we also have to keep, we also have to keep that in mind uh, as we do mission as disciples no? in the local church. No? Uh, we cannot just disregard uh, uh, the local indigenous cultures. So meaning we're dealing with uh, 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 the different cultures of the people uh, in terms of uh, the general pop culture and uh, 
the cultural differences between generations. And in many of our local churches, in many of our dioceses, uh, we are also dealing with the cultures and in contact with the cultures of our indigenous peoples, uh, which we need to respect. No? Our situation then can be, to borrow a term that's used in mostly in education and the business world, uh, uh, our situation is then characterized by this word uh, VUCA, no? which means uh, volatility, no? U for uncertainty, C for complexity, and A for ambiguity. Now, this is very familiar to those of us who are uh, in education or in business. But this also describes our field of mission, as, is, as we say, as mission, missionary disciples in the local church. So how do we deal with this? With, with the context of all the social problems that we have, with the context of uh, coming out of the COVID-19 lockdowns. No? Uh, uh, VUCA no? is brought about by advances in technology, no? uh, uh, which are affecting our very lives. No? During the pandemic, the use of, for example, virtual uh, technologies. No? So we've been meeting uh, virtually and even uh, uh, this uh, symposium is done in a hybrid manner. I understand. No? So uh, uh, I am I'm speaking to you uh, through, through virtually. No? virtually. You know, I, I cannot see you. I don't know uh, your faces. No? Uh, but technology has, has brought about uh, many, much good but it has also brought about a situation of VUCA. And this is our field of mission as missionary disciples. Okay. Bevans and Schroeder, in their book, Constance in Context, point out that the church only becomes church as it responds to God's call to mission. And to be in mission means to change continually as the gospel encounters new and diverse contexts. And I think it is very important to, to keep this in mind. From the very beginning, the church was formed as it responded to God's call to mission. And as it expanded, as it did mission, it changed no? as the gospel encountered new situations, new context. From the beginning of the church, during the apostolic times to today, the church has to change continually. You know? uh, uh, because as the gospel encounters new situations, the church has to find ways to respond to this new situations. Of course, there are things we know that remain constant. No? God's love for us as shown by the incarnation of, of Jesus. God's compassion towards His people. No? The community of disciples. The Eucharist. Many things remain constant. But as we do mission, as we, we spread the good news in the changing situations, we need to adapt in the way we respond you know, in order to bring the gospel more closely to the people in the situations we encounter. Okay. So, in this context then, you know, there are I think some characteristics of missionary discipleship that is important you know, given what was said before in terms of the social situation uh, we have and uh, the, the situation and context of uh, VUCA. Okay. And the first one is that of the need to be resilient and flexible. And to be resilient and flexible we need to be able to truly listen. Listen to 
the situation, to have our ears on the ground, to know what's happening, what are our people going through in a given situation. It is only when we do listen and we do take what we hear seriously that we're able to respond in an appropriate manner. And it's only when we listen that we can be flexible. No? So, again, no, this is related to, to change. No? Because if we are inflexible, we cannot change. We cannot respond to the situation. No? So, as missionary disciples, we need to, to be conscious about the need to be uh, flexible and resilient. Uh, since the time I was asked to, to give a talk on, on, on this topic, uh, and I res when, I res and I, when I first started reflecting, the, the, ha the biggest issue then was EJ case, extrajudicial killings, no? uh, which was very, it was happening in, a, in an alarming scale, uh, especially during that time. And this was what was confronting a lot of our, our pastors. No? Uh, a lot. I remember talking to, to Bishop David and the situation in the Diocese of Kaloocan. No? And then, and then COVID-19 happened. And then uh, uh, the world changed. No? The world as we knew it changed. No? And then now in the Philippines, uh, we're in the midst of uh, uh, election season. And... Uh, and uh, we're looking at situations of, for example, the prevalence of fake news. And if you look at many of the comments, many of them are filled with uh, verbal violence no? <laughs> and, and hatred. So how does one uh, do mission? No? How does one uh, act as a missionary disciple in such uh, a context? Uh, I recently took a course, and in that course, uh, I was introduced to, to what's called the metaverse. No? The metaverse, a virtual world brought about by technology. How does one do mission in such a context? How does one live as a missionary disciple in the context of the metaverse, for example? So we need to be flexible. We need to be resilient. And very related to flexibility and resilience is the need to be creative, to, to find ways you know, beyond uh, what we are used to. Uh, creativity in the context of mission uh, often demands that we go out of what is familiar, uh, to move out uh, from our own uh, comfort zones no? uh, and find new means, new ways, new methods to be able to spread the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in order to be flexible, one has to be creative. No? We cannot, we cannot uh, expect different results if we keep on doing the same things, exactly the same things. No? We need to keep what is good and throw out what is no longer effective. No? So uh, if we think about it, uh, after 500 years of, of Christianity, we have all these social problems. We have massive poverty. We have widespread corruption. Uh, we have so much unkindness, uh, uh, at least on social media. No? Of course, uh, we know a lot of people who are kind and compassionate. Uh, but we need to ask why. So if you want change, we need to be creative. We need to find new and fresh ways to once again proclaim the same good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot keep on doing the same things and expect different results. So if we are to, 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 
to proclaim the Word of God, we need to be creative. Continuous, continuous learning. This is something that is uh, very familiar in, in, in my own sphere of education. A lifelong learning. To continually learn. Okay. And uh, you know, as this quote says, continuous learning is the minimum requirement for success in any field. And we could say that continuous learning is the minimum requirement for success in mission. No. For success as missionary disciples. Again, we see that this is related to creativity and to flexibility. No? We continually learn. And this includes uh, the embrace of uh, whatever technology offers us today. Uh, I mentioned the metaverse. I mentioned social media. We need to, to be immersed and to know what is this about? No? Instead of just saying, I don't know. I, I'm not familiar with technology and therefore uh, leave me alone. No? Uh, it is important to, to keep on learning. Uh, I remember the late Archbishop Carmelo Morelos. No? Even in his 80s, uh, I remember one, uh, one situation when I, was, I had an iPad with me. And he said, what's that? And I explained to him what a tablet was. And he said, oh, I want one. And he really learned how to use uh, the tablet, no? the iPad. So the embracing of, of technology for mission is important. No? As missionary disciples then, uh, we need to keep in mind that we need to be flexible and resilient. We need to be creative. And we need to have an attitude of continuous learning, embracing what is good in the new for the mission. No? And this we do in the context, of course, of the local church. So we need to reflect you know, in our actual contexts of how we can be missionary disciples no? uh, in our immediate surroundings, our workplaces, our parishes. Uh, how can we be uh, more effective in sharing the gospel with those we are con in contact with. We are very familiar with charisms. We are very familiar with this quote of St. Paul from his letter to the Romans. Uh, and I show this slide to, to, to emphasize that while we receive different charisms at baptism, we need to keep in mind that all these charisms are at the service of the one body, Jesus Christ. No? And this means that as missionary disciples, we do not just act individually. No? We need to act in a communal way. All these charisms we have as individuals have to come together in a concerted effort no? uh, for the one body, Jesus Christ and His church. Uh, it means by necessity that we have to be united. United with our bishop, united with our priests, united as a people of God, as a community of disciples. Let me point out that as we, we do mission, no? uh, uh, that our mission really is to, to be characterized by uh, love and joy. No? Uh, if just as a, a point of interest, no, we have this word count from uh, Evangelii Gaudium. No? And the word love appears 154 times and the word joy appears 109 times. No? And so on down the list, the poor, peace, justice, and counter dignity, and the common good. So we keep in mind that in, in the context we find before us as we, we live as our mission no? and our journey as missionary disciples in the local church that we need to spread love and kindness and compassion in the face of so much hatred and violence in today's world. No? Uh, as a matter of, and we know this as a matter of fact, uh, 
the mission, the spreading of the gospel is best done through the witness of our lives. So at its very base, you know, as missionary disciples, we need to be the face of love and kindness and compassion. In Evangelii Gaudium number 27, the Holy Father says, I dream of a missionary option, that is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. So, perhaps this, in a way, summarizes a lot of what, uh, uh, a lot of the points that uh, I have uh, said, uh, already said you know, before, uh, that we have to, to find new ways, you know? uh, we, because we want to transform society to, to, to build the kingdom of God. Okay. Uh, and as my last point, uh, given uh, sometimes when we, we think of the situation before us and the work of the mission, sometimes we, we feel burdened, no? We feel, uh, we, we, we feel uh, as, as the young say now, uh, stressed out, no? Uh, but we keep in mind that, uh, that in the end, we are a people of hope, no? It is, we just celebrated the resurrection of our Lord, no? And thus, we hold on to hope, okay? And with this hope, we exude joy, no? So as this uh, uh, quote from uh, the first letter of Peter, Peter, chapter 1, tells us. So I will end my uh, sharing here, and I leave you with this quote from uh, our local hero, Jose Rizal. No? <laughs> Con el recuerdo del pasado, entro en el porvenir. I enter the future with a memory of the past. No? So we recall with thanks and celebration the coming of Christianity to our shores 500 years ago. And as we celebrate and recall, this great gift of the Christian faith, we enter the future with this memory. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you have found this uh, sharing uh, helpful. Good evening. <music>